it is now my pleasure to introduce our second Ed Talk. Paul Kelly spoke at our 2012 National Forum and is backed by popular demand. He is a former teacher and principal in the UK who now serves as the Honorary Research Associate with the Sleep and Circadian Neuroscience Institute. But Paul is also an American-born educator who attended K-12 school in the great state of Nevada. Dr. Kelly was the guest author of an ECS Progress of Education Reform Brief on later school times in adolescence what, that we released last month. And I can tell you that out of the thousands of ECS documents you can find on our website, the one on adolescence and start times for school is the only one my 15-year-old son has read. <laughs> we are honored to have Paul Kelly join us so that he can give us the latest on what's happening at the intersection of neuroscience research and education policy. And I know many of you are curious about this topic, so please help me in welcoming Dr. Kelly. Okay, thanks a lot. Okay. There's a clue about what the talk's going to be about. I'd like to share with you the implications of having a time schedule, a time pattern in schools that actually raises standards and at the same time improves health and mental health. In order to do that, we have to distinguish between two kinds of time. Our clock tells us that times are the same for everybody. Our biological timing system says timing is different for everybody. I'd like to take you on a journey in biological time, in time patterns in the brain, in time patterns in the day, in time patterns in our life. The damage that can happen if we disrupt those time patterns and the potential they have to improve education. It's a journey that changed my way of looking at the world. I want to change the way you look at the world and get you to set your clocks to the right time. Um, for, for me, um, I'm jet lagged. Uh, I have um, a body that's telling me that it's late in the afternoon. And um, you look at the time, the pattern of time, and you ask yourself, well, in the human brain, what's special about the time pattern there? And the basic conclusion is it's very fast. It's like a complex city's transportation and communication system uh, without the traffic jams. Now, it's odd, but they actually, images of the brain sometimes look a bit like a city. Uh, they have the signals in the brain Actually, it's a time pattern that encodes all the information. Neurons can make a signal in milliseconds. The brain can receive those signals and then translate the time pattern into the meaning. And all of this happens in super fast time. And in fact, we even know a time pattern that will tell the brain that this is something worth, worth remembering, and it will. At the same time, the highways of the mind over on the right are hugely complicated and therefore they have speed limits. So the speed limits in the highway of the mind are about 250 miles an hour. So you can imagine how that would work in Washington's transport systems. Now, if this time system is disrupted by sleep deprivation, illness, or aging, then any of these systems can break down and fail. In the day, there's a time pattern, and it's set to the light-dark cycle of 24 hours. And in this 24-hour time pattern, the, every cell in our body, every organ, every system is got a time schedule for the day and the night, and it's different. That's because having all your body functions happen at the same time is not a good idea. <laughs> so there's a pacemaker that coordinates across your day and your night a single schedule for you personally, and that single schedule is something 
that allows you to know individually there is a time. There is a time to wake. There is a time to eat. There is a time to digest. There's a time to learn. There's a time to do homework. There's a time to take a test, all of which are different. There's a time to work. There's a time to rest. There's a time to sleep. There's a time to dream. Now, there are dangers, too. There's a time to exercise, and there's a time not to exercise. Between 9 to 10 in the morning is the time most fatal heart attack occurs. The whole of the system, how is it the pacemaker entrained? How does it work to the light-dark cycle? And the answer is only through the sun. It's the single thing, sunlight, that determines our daily patterns. It's only very recently that they discovered cells, new kinds of cells in the eye. They don't perceive visions. They perceive particular colors only. The dark blue of sunlight at dusk and dawn. Now, those then report to the SCN, or suprachiasmatic neuron in the hypothalamus, and that establishes the time pattern for the SCN pacemaker that organizes this. The organization of all our time patterns over 24 hours of 73 trillion cells in our body is done by that mechanism. And if that's disrupted by sleep deprivation, by illness or aging, then those patterns can fail and any of its functions can fail. Now, our time patterns also change with age. Just considering ourselves now, we know as babies we slept a lot more, but we also woke up more, so we had this very odd on and off sleep cycle. We then knew, we then knew that by the time we reached 10, we would have a sleep cycle. We get up and we go to sleep in a regular way. Now, at 10, there are differences. There are genetic differences between some people who wake up early and some people who go to sleep early, and the people who wake up late and the people who then go to sleep late. Now, those are you keep. And your cycle at 10, you're going to meet again when you're 55, because the cycle at 10 and the cycle at 55 are the same. I know, I've been there, done that. But in adolescence, the time pattern shifts to later times and later sleep times. Now, it happens alongside puberty, but it starts later. So it starts a year or two later. There's a gradual shift that builds up speed, and it carries on until your early 20s. Now, at the time you get to the early 20s, this time cycle is having you wake up later and go to sleep later. And the range that happened for us, it was about 2.5 hours later than when we were 10. Now, it is, like puberty, an irreversible, inbuilt physical mechanism. And the consequence of that is puberty is something that takes us from childhood and makes a lot of changes, some of which are highly undesirable. And, uh, but nevertheless, it happens to all adolescents. We can't change it. They can't change it. And it makes us help us translate into adult behaviors. The wake-sleep shift is another one of those. And if it is disrupted, this pattern, by sleep deprivation or illness, or indeed changes over time, then the functions can fail. Now, here's a particular example. Doctors working for 24 hours. 
This is Harvard Medical School. They were worried about the consequences of sleep deprivation in young interns, but also in residents and burnout. This is what they found. Now, you look at that and you begin to worry about sleep disruption having an effect which is somehow far beyond what we thought it was. Now, in actual fact, the kind of level of sleep deprivation that adolescents have at the moment is about 2.7 hours every day, every school, every college, every work day until they're in their early 20s. Now, you're looking at this and you think, well, 2.7 hours each school day is not like having a 24-hour shift. It isn't. It's worse. The impact on your performance and your function of 2.7 hours a day is like having two 24-hour shifts each week. And these have a huge negative impact on your performance and all the functions of your timing system. Now, this is just a list of some of them. And the effect is almost immediate. So a single week with 2.7 hours each day produces changes in 711 of your genes' behaviors. Now, you look at the list and you think this is seriously dangerous. But in fact, it's worse than that. Not everyone is, is fully aware, but the onset of most mental illnesses in adolescence. The onset is associated with sleep disruption. And the last thing the young adolescents need is to be sleep deprived. There is a single clinical mental health issue that affects three million young Americans alone. In contrast, later shifts lead to better performance, less illness, higher achievement. And changing the school timetable from being early to fit in with this, it's something that brings many benefits at virtually no cost. So this part of the story is the happy ending with the hero. Except I'm not the hero. I'm far from the hero. I came into education to make a difference to young people I, and to let them rise up the system like our family did. But in all my years, even after I did all the changes and saw the positives, I know that I damaged more children by making them come to school early than I'll ever be able to put right. So are, if they're going to be heroes, it's going to be you. You are going to be able to change education time. You are going to be able to make the education of every child, every school, and our country better. All you have to do is change education clocks. Thank you.